It's 5 p.m. across India. I'm Tanvi Tanija. Live from New Delhi, you're watching DD India Global. We'll bring you all the day's big stories from across India and the world. Joining me today from Brussels is my colleague, Oli Barrett. Good afternoon to you, Oli. Good afternoon, Tanvi. It's 1.30 p.m. here and across Central Europe. Coming up in the next 30 minutes, we'll have the latest from the Ukraine conflict, the latest as well on why Joe Biden's greenlighting Donald Trump's border wall. First, the headlines. Jailed Iranian human rights activist Nargis Mohammadi wins the 2023 Nobel Peace Prize for her fight against the oppression of women in Iran. The Norwegian Nobel Committee has decided to award the Nobel Peace Prize for 2023 to Nargis Mohammadi. The Pentagon says the United States will continue to foster stronger defense ties with India, calls China a pacing challenge. Indian government announces over 4 million US dollars in assistance for thousands affected in India's northeastern state of Sikkim after Wednesday's flash floods. And in the Hangzhou Asian Games, India inches closer to the 100 medal mark. The men win silver in recurve archery, women win bronze, Sonam wins bronze in wrestling. Jailed Iranian activist Nargis Mohammadi has won the Nobel Peace Prize 2023 for her fight against the oppression of women and her fight to promote human rights and freedom for all. Mohammadi, who is serving a 12-year jail sentence, is one of Iran's leading human rights activists who has campaigned for women's rights, scrapping of the death penalty and improvement of prison conditions in Iran. Despite being in prison, Mohammadi has rallied immense support for the Woman Life Freedom Movement against the government in Iran last year. The Norwegian Nobel Committee has decided to award the Nobel Peace Prize for 2023 to Nargis Mohammadi for her fight against the oppression of women in Iran and her fight to promote human rights and freedom for all. Expressing his happiness on Nargis's win, her husband, Taghi Rehmani, said that the Nobel Peace Prize will further encourage Nargis's struggle and the movement she leads. This Nobel Peace Prize will open a door for Nargis motives in fighting for human rights. It will make her fearless. But most importantly, this prize is given for the movement of Masa Amini, Women Life Freedom. Nargis is one of the face of this movement that is receiving it. So, by naming Nargis Mohammadi as this year's Nobel Peace Prize winner, the Nobel Committee has described it as the first and foremost a recognition of a whole movement in Iran with its undisputed leader, Nargis Mohammadi. She was, she was selected to be this year's winner from 350 nominations. Did India's Stuart Smith reports from London. The Nobel Committee describes Mohammadi as an advocate for equality and human rights, a campaigner against the use of the death penalty and a leader of last year's women's rights protests against the government in Iran. Currently behind bars, she's been convicted five times, arrested 13 and in total sentenced to 31 years in prison for multiple charges, including spreading propaganda against the state. The head of the Norwegian Nobel Committee says he hopes Iranian authorities will release her so she may accept the award in December. 
winners of the prize, who can be organizations or individuals, receive a million US dollars, a medal and a certificate. They're selected by a committee based on information provided by international advisors over an eight-month-long decision-making process. Mohammadi has beaten more than 350 other nominees for this year's prize. Her husband, who lives with their two children as a refugee in France, says she's the most determined person he knows, with three causes in life, respect for human rights, her feminist commitment, and justice for all the crimes that have been committed. On her official Instagram page, her family wrote that the honor of receiving the prize belongs to all Iranians, especially the women and girls of Iran who, quote, captivated the world with their bravery in fighting for freedom and equality. Stuart Smith in London, reporting for DD India. Moving on, in a press conference held in Washington, the Pentagon has said they very much appreciate their defense ties with India and will continue to foster partnership with the country in this area. Pentagon Press Secretary Pat Ryder said the United States will continue to foster a stronger defense partnership with India. In 1997, defense trade between India and the United States was almost negligible. Today, it stands above $20 billion. Further, responding to a question on relations with China, Ryder said, China remains the pacing challenge for the U.S. Department of Defense. Well, you know, we've been very clear on this, right? China remains the pacing challenge for the Department of Defense, uh, and we do appreciate uh, the partnership that we have with India and other countries in the Indo-Pacific region when it comes to preserving uh, individual nations' sovereignty uh, and abiding by the international, um, international rules. Uh, based order that has preserved peace and stability for, for many years. Russian President Vladimir Putin has once again commended India, stating that the country's leadership is self-guided and self-driven by its national interests. Speaking at the Waldai International Discussion Club in Sochi, Putin backed India for a permanent seat in the UN Security Council. He also lauded India for consistently registering a strong economic growth. Certainly, in the UN Security Council, such countries should be represented that are acquiring significant clout in international affairs, and due to their potential, they have an opportunity to contribute to issues. What countries am I talking about? India, more than 1.5 billion people live in India. Over 7 percent GDP growth, 7.4 or 7.6 percent, that is a giant in the world. Indeed, there are a lot of people there who need assistance and help, but nevertheless, high-tech export is growing exponentially. It is a ground power. It is becoming more stronger with every passing year with the leadership, under the leadership of Prime Minister Modi. Putin also he praises on India for organizing the G20 summit, terming it a great success under Prime Minister Modi. He added that the Delhi summit was a success because the Indian Prime Minister managed to depoliticize the decisions that were made there. India is the ancient global civilization. It's a huge civilization. It's a powerful civilization with uh, vast potential. As for the Group of 20, that was a success of the Indian authorities and of Prime Minister Modi personally. That was a success. And the Indian authorities managed to find, to achieve, to accomplish this balance, including in the declaration and some clothes, clothes clubs, they have no future because balance is changing. Why do I think the G20 summit in India was a success? Because the prime minister managed to depoliticize the decisions that were made at the G20 summit. 
on to Europe now. The latest drone and missile strikes by Russia against Ukraine, both on Thursday and Friday, tell us that it will be a tough second winter of lengthy counteroffensives. Meanwhile, Kremlin has defended its point of de-ratifying the nuclear test ban treaty, saying it is to match the U.S. position. My colleague Oli Barrett is in Brussels today. He tracks all these developments from the region and also tells us more on other stories making headlines around the world. Let's go over Thank to Oli now. Thank you, And yes, indeed, when it comes to Russia, Moscow has launched a new drone and missile strike on Ukraine early on Friday local time, killing a 10-year-old boy in the northeastern city of Kharkiv. The attack comes just days after another Russian missile strike on a village in northeastern Ukraine in which 52 people are now known to have been killed. According to the regional governor, the strike damaged the grain port infrastructure in the southern region of Odessa. In the latest strikes, Ukrainian air defenses shot down 25 of 33 drones launched by Russia from the annexed Crimean Peninsula. Staying with Russia, the President Vladimir Putin has hinted at the potential of resuming nuclear testing. Russia's top lawmaker said parliamentary leaders will propose revoking the ratification of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. A Kremlin spokesperson has now clarified that de-ratifying the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty is to match the U.S. position and not to carry out a test. Russia possesses the world's largest stockpile of nuclear weapons. Sasha Chernyshova reports now from Moscow. Well, that's right. We have heard the Russian president addressing the participants of the Valdai Forum in Sochi on Thursday. The understanding is that Moscow is certain that it will achieve the goals of what it describes as a special military operation in Ukraine. The Russian president said that steadily Moscow was moving towards the achievement of the goals that have been stated at the start of this operation, demilitarization and denazification of Ukraine. He was once again referring to uh, the fact that Russia is a large country and doesn't need more territorial gains. So that's why the conflict in Ukraine is not about territories. It is about the threat that has been posed by the Western countries against Russia. So that's why he said that uh, Moscow is in Ukraine in order to stop the war that has been unleashed by Kyiv authorities against the residents of Donbass. Uh, the Russian president was also talking indeed about the use of nuclear weapons, the nuclear rhetoric that we uh, from time to time hear uh, from the Russian officials. He was clearly saying that Russia is going to update its nuclear arsenal. With regard to that, he was saying that Sarmat intercontinental ballistic missile capable of carrying nuclear weapons will soon get to the combat duty. And also we understand that Budivestnik uh, intercontinental ballistic missile also capable of carrying nuclear weapons has been successfully tested. So indeed, Russia is um, showing to the world that it is capable of protecting itself in the best possible way. At the same time, the Russian president has criticized the United States for not ratifying the comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty, saying that uh, Moscow has not only signed but also ratified this treaty. But given the very fact that the situation is changing globally, Moscow could move towards revoking that ratification. And uh, on Friday morning, the speaker of the Russian uh, State Duma, Vyacheslav Volodin, was saying that indeed uh, at the next session of the State Duma, the, uh, the, the lawmakers will be indeed discussing the possibility of revoking that ratification. Well, Ukraine faces a second winter of potentially lengthy power outages and relentless Russian missile and drone attacks that have left parts of the energy system more vulnerable than a year ago. Engineers have been working through the summer to try and fix damaged machinery and improve air defenses that will help mitigate the impact of the war as temperatures begin to drop. Russia continues to deny Ukraine's accusation that it intentionally destroys electricity infrastructure in order to cause misery to people. It claims that only military facilities are the target. We know that there has been huge damage, but Ukraine has refused to give specific information about the effects of attacks on its energy grid because it considers it to be sensitive.
Ми робимо все, щоб ми робимо все, що ми можемо, щоб Україна отримала більше аеродифенсивних систем перед вінтер. Зараз ми чекаємо на наших партнерів, щоб взяти певні рішення. Але всі спілкування відповідно або відповідно критичних фасилітів, або їхні вирішення реконструкції, які відбувають на рівні регіонального рівня, мають бути пріоритетні перед вінтер починається. Parliamentarians from across the NATO alliance are meeting in Denmark for the latest annual get-together of the group's lawmakers. The meeting will focus on reiterating the alliance's focus on supporting Ukraine at a time when some worry that public opinion in the West is starting to shift. This is the first assembly session in which Finland is joining as a full member of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly following its accession to NATO on April the 4th. DD India's Alex Kadier reports from Brussels. 274 members of parliament from 31 countries are meeting to ensure their assemblies are in lockstep with the direction set by the NATO alliance. The gathering of alliance lawmakers represents an opportunity for close collaboration between allies, particularly as domestic political headwinds have started to challenge the alliance's main focus, supporting Ukraine. Slovakia recently okay. elected a Kremlin-friendly okay. prime minister, while American support for Kyiv has started to waver as a result of political infighting in Washington, D.C. Part of the alliance's response to Russia's attempted invasion of Ukraine has focused on delivering weapons to Kyiv's forces whilst not depleting NATO stocks. Parliamentarians from across the alliance have had to work to pass legislation facilitating financing and procurement of arms across the board. Crucially, the lawmakers will also discuss the democratic values which they consider to be at the very core of the NATO alliance and its mission around the world. The exiled leader of Belarus's opposition will be addressing the gathering and receiving an award for her work in promoting democratic values despite the risks in Belarus. Beyond the 31 allies, associate members of NATO have also been invited to join. Azerbaijan, which recently launched a military operation to seize control of the disputed region of Nagorno-Karabakh, will send members of its parliament, including the chair of its defense committee. Above all, this meeting of NATO lawmakers will aim to send a strong signal that the alliance remains united, setting the stage for NATO defense ministers' meeting here in Brussels in a week's time. Alex Kadye in Brussels, reporting for DD India. Next to Syria, where a drone attack on a military academy in the city of Homs has killed at least 100 people after Syria's defense minister left a graduation ceremony there. The Syrian health minister says it was a bloody attack which targeted a graduation ceremony attended by cadets' families, women and children as well. Syria's defense and foreign ministries have vowed to respond with full force. And then Syrian forces carried out heavy bombing attacks on the opposition-held zone of Idlib throughout the day. Syria's conflict began with protests against Bashar al-Assad in 2011, but spiraled into an all-out war that has left thousands dead and millions displaced. European leaders have called on Armenia and Azerbaijan to release all detainees and to cooperate in addressing the fate of missing persons. On the sidelines of the European Political Community Summit, the leaders underlined their unwavering support for the independence, sovereignty and territorial integrity of Armenia's borders. The leaders also expressed their support for the strengthening of EU-Armenia relations and agreed on the need to provide additional humanitarian assistance to the nation as well. Russian President Vladimir Putin, meanwhile, says Armenia remains an ally of Russia. He says Moscow is ready to continue to help the Armenians of Karabakh, but he claims Armenia did not listen to Russia's proposals on Nagorno-Karabakh. No, 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 no. Armenia remains our ally. If there are humanitarian issues, of course we are ready and we will discuss them. We are ready to support and provide help to these people. It goes without saying. French President Emmanuel Macron, meanwhile, has criticized Azerbaijan for taking military action in Nagorno-Karabakh. It's not France that has a problem with Azerbaijan. It's Azerbaijan that has a problem today with the commitments it makes. 
with keeping its own words and with respecting international law. I don't think the time is ripe for sanctions because they would be counterproductive and would not do the best job of protecting Armenian territory and its people. That's it from me for today here in Brussels. I have a date with some Mool Frit. So Tanvi, back to you in the studio. Thank you, Oli. Oli Barrett joining us from Brussels. You're watching DD India Global, still to come on the show. Poland refuses to allow new migrants, says it rejects European Union's plans to accept illegal migrants. And India's central bank keeps its benchmark rate unchanged, highlighting a fall in retail inflation in September. We are taking up a very special country, the Dominican Republic. Dominican Republic is uh, an important uh, player in the Caribbean and the Latin American region and is uh, enhancing its uh, bilateral cooperation with India on a range of dimensions. The Dominicans are also attracted to the practice of yoga, for example. This is a practice that is very popular there and we have felt the benefits that yoga brings that are not just physical but spiritual and mental and this really has become very popular in the dominican republic and also as also concerns the gastronomy of india the dominican republic is getting to know more about it and enjoying indian gastronomy Welcome back. You're watching DD India Global. I am Tanvi Taneja. The Indian government is taking various steps to assist the northeastern state of Sikkim to combat the damage caused by the recent flash floods. India's Home Ministry has approved more than five million U.S. dollars in funds to help provide relief to the people affected in the state. The Home Ministry has also formed a team which will assess the damage caused by the floods, which will help in deciding any further assistance. Meanwhile, two days after the devastating flash floods in Sikkim, efforts are underway to provide relief for the flood hit and also hunt for those who are still missing. Thousands of tourists who were stuck in the flood hit areas are being safely evacuated. The Indian Army, along with the National Disaster Response Force, are continuing their search and rescue operations. As of now, around 40 people are confirmed dead and over 200 remain missing. Still with India, India's central bank, the Reserve Bank of India, has decided to keep the repo rate unchanged at 6.5%. The Reserve Bank of India governor said that the transmission of 250 basis point repo rate cut is still incomplete. While announcing the Monetary Policy Committee statement for October this year, the RBI governor said that the headline inflation had surged in July but has eased further in September. Last year in the first quarter, it was 7.3%. This year in the first quarter, the headline inflation moderated to 4.6%. A significant uh, easing of inflation pressures from its exceptionally high level in July and August is expected to materialize in September as the impact of fleeting food price shocks wane. Further, underlying inflation pressures are also moderating while the impact of past monetary policy actions is still unfolding. The IMC Chamber of Commerce and Industry has welcomed the central bank's decision to keep the key interest rates unchanged. The RBI and the government of India working in tandem. The fiscal policies and the monetary policies are working well together. The government of India is looking at the supply side of agriculture, industrial products, and the clever sourcing of oil. And also the uh, policies of the RBI with an eye on inflation and also a policy that supports economic growth. I think it's a very good policy. And now let's take a look at other stories making news around the world. 
Poland has rejected European Union's plan to accept illegal migrants and punish members who refuse to cooperate. Under an agreement reached by the European Union members, countries that receive migrants could speed up asylum procedures and can ask for swift help from the EU peers. In a significant achievement, Spanish police have seized 74 tons of stolen olives in Seville. Twelve people have been arrested so far for their alleged involvement in theft and sale of stolen olives. Thai government has announced a compensation of 6.2 million baht to the families of each victim of a deadly shooting at a luxury mall. Earlier on Tuesday, two people were killed while five were injured after a teenager opened fire in the mall in Bangkok. Philippine Coast Guard protested against a provocative move by the Chinese Coast Guard. Reports indicate that a Chinese vessel attempted to block a mission to resupply Philippine troops on a disputed island. However, the Philippines confirmed that it had successfully resupplied its troops. And on to sporting action now. India's wrestler Sonam won bronze medal in women's 62 kg freestyle wrestling. Sonam defeated Chinese opponent with a clutch two-pointer with seconds left in the bout. The two wrestlers were locked 4-4 and the Chinese was ahead on criteria. Sonam then effected a crucial takedown move with just 25 seconds left in the bronze playoff to emerge a 7-5 winner. India crushed Pakistan to enter the men's kabaddi final on Friday. India dominated right from the beginning and went on to inflict six all-out, commanding 61-14 win. India will play Iran in the final on Saturday. That's all in this edition of DD India Global. Tune in at 7.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time for another edition of the show live from Washington, D.C. Also, do let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. Connect with us on Facebook. X, formerly Twitter and Instagram at DD India Live. You can also find us online at ddindia.co.in. We will be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I am Tanvita Nija from my entire team in New Delhi. Thanks for watching. Namaskar. Welcome to Jaipur.